Good morning. We're going to have you take your seats now. Uh, it's a wonderful networking opportunity, but we need to get started or we won't hear those wonderful speakers. So please, if you could take your seat, grab your coffee, and I'll give you just a couple seconds to sit down so that we can start this event. Um, we have phenomenal speakers and panelists. We have a, a great crowd. We have students in the, the crowd that can network with you, so we're so glad you're here. Good morning. For many of you who have come to this year after year, I know you're disappointed we don't have our annual snowstorm with sleet and ice. <laughs> but it's coming. <laughs> we just missed it. My name is Jean Nagelkirk, and I'm the Vice Provost for Health here at Grand Valley State University. On behalf of the Seedman College of Business Alumni Association in my office, welcome to our healthcare economic forecast. We're thrilled that you're here, and we have wonderful panelists and researchers to present for you today to learn new information. And then, of course, we have time for questions and answers. But before we begin, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Philomena Mantella, the fifth president of Grand Valley State University. Dr. Mantella is one of higher education's leading entrepreneurs. She is a recognized leader in strategic thinking, market dynamics, and innovation in the way education is delivered. She started in, in Grand Valley on Jan, July 1st, but believe me, she is off and running and has developed many innovations that we will be rolling out. Please help me welcome President Mantella. Good morning, and let's give a big thank you to Jean Nagelkirk, who uh, coordinates a lot of this, along with our Business Alumni Association. May we? Thank you, Jean. Well, this is really exciting for me. You know, I looked at my calendar. I said, West Michigan Healthcare Economic Forecast. What a great idea for Grand Valley State University to collaborate and thank you to our wonderful sponsors, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan, Blue Care Network and Priority Health. There is nothing more uh, fundamental to our economy than health and there's nothing more fundamental to our community than health and the ability for um, that our enterprises to grow, the policies behind them, the economic conditions that surround them, the access and opportunity for all, the service. There's so many dimensions. So what a great concept. I take zero credit for it in my six months, um, but really proud to be the one to welcome you to this really important event and looking forward to our speakers today. Um, the annual health check study provides insight to the health trends in Kent, Ottawa, Muskegon, and Allegan counties. The results of the research of, the, of Professor Lind and the Seidman College of Business and the Q&A that will follow facilitated by Jerry Simons, professor in the GVS Seidman College of Business, should be very enlightening for all of us. Collaborations such as this are important as catalysts to bring together the healthcare community and those of us who are stakeholders in the wellness of our community more broadly. Professionals, executives, service providers, government officials, representatives, ed educators, and individual community members to discuss the challenges in front of us and to develop policies and programs to meet them. At Grand Valley, with 24,000 students on our multiple campuses and our sites throughout the state. We are proud to be one of the highest producers of healthcare professionals in over 22 programs and 65 health-related programs with nearly 10,000 students touching the health field of those 24,000 learners. That's pretty amazing. It's one of the largest and most substantial and most well-integrated part of our university portfolio. So you can see that we are deeply committed to building the healthcare talent workforce of the future. In May, we opened a second facility with the Ralph J. Finkelstein Hall. 
And it, we will shortly open our third building with the Daniel, Daniel and Pamela DeVos Center for Interprofessional Health at 333 Michigan. So we're growing, we're expanding, we're committed to find new ways uh, to produce healthcare workers at the quality and demands um, that our community needs. So really looking forward to join you in this journey today to get a level set on the economic conditions. Thank you to all who are sponsoring it, facilitating, speaking today, and uh, let's get started. Thank you. Thank you, President Mantella, for those insightful remarks. So Grand Valley is especially pleased to host today's event. As Dr. Mantella says, we're the largest provider of health professions for this region, and the growth and expansion of the healthcare industry needs the wonderful talent that we have here. So we're excited about that. We're also pleased to share with you today about a new venture that we have embarked on. We have opened the Grand Valley State University Battle Creek Regional Outreach Center. The center will provide the overarching coordination for the 12 grant initiatives for the five point, um, for the $15.5 million, $15 million Kellogg grant received over five years. The center will provide career and college exploration and advising to students and community members, as well as provide educational events for K-12 and the community. Now we would like to thank each of you for being here and supporting Grand Valley State University. Many of you or your colleagues serve as clinical or research preceptors. Some of you guest lecture. Others provide your time, talent, and resources. To each of you, we are grateful for your contribution and support of the success of our students. I too would like to recognize three individuals who sponsored us for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Um, David is here, David Brown, and I saw for Priority Health, Jan Yu, and maybe Inez Vigil. Can you stand up and wave so we can recognize you? Thank you. I would also re like to recognize Diane. Diane, can you wave in the back there? She is our special projects coordinator and does a phenomenal job. This morning we will have two distinguished professors of economics who will discuss the research and facilitate questions. Following their presentation, we will have a distinguished panel of health experts who will analyze and make predictions about the health care of the future and how they collaborate and provide that quality care that we be rely upon. During their presentations, you will notice on your seat there are cards. Please jot those down because a few minutes before the presentations are done, I will have staff walking through and collecting them so we can do the Q&A portion seamlessly. Each of you have received a copy of the health check. For those who are listening to this through live streaming, the publication is online where you registered for the site. The information in this publication is intended to inform health care policy and community decisions about the types of health care professionals that we need, the costs of care, the services provided, and the types of delivery systems that are best to meet the needs of our community for the quality safe care. Now a brief introduction for our two Seidman College of Business researchers. Sebastian Lind is an assistant professor of economics at Grand Valley. He earned his bachelor's in economics and finance at Cardiff University in Wales before obtaining a master's in economic at Cambridge University. He then completed a master's degree in mathematics at Loyola University in Chicago before earning a doctoral degree in economics at Purdue. Sebastian's research interests include industrial organization of healthcare markets, health economics, and applied macroeconomics. Jerry Simon is a professor of economics in the Seidman College of Business. He received his bachelor's of social work in money, I'm sorry, in money, banking, and finance from the University of Birmingham in his native England, and followed this with a MA and PhD in economics at the University of Can Kansas. He has authored many articles. Let's welcome them to the stage.
Okay, good morning everyone, and I am very happy to see that we have a fully packed room, and I'm very happy we all could make it, because the last two years have been a bit of a struggle and a bit of adjustment for me, especially coming here. Um, well, from Purdue, it's, it's relative similar weather, but um, from where I've been before, this has been considerably more snow. Um, with regards to the health check, we'll be talking about the 11th edition of a report today, and it's a big report as you can see, so we're going to be focusing in on three particular parts. I'll start off by providing a little bit more of a broader overview, looking at the trends related to healthcare behavior, and this is going to be drawing on data coming from the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. And after that, we'll draw on some data from the American Hospital Association and look at costs and utilization rates relating to our uh, Grand Rapids area for hospitals. And we'll compare this to some benchmarks across the nation. And the very last part of our presentation, we'll draw on data coming from our community partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Blue Care Network, and Priority Health. And with this, we'll try to assess our communities a chronic disease burden. So we'll look here not only on how that has changed in terms of expenditures across time, but we'll also look and compare across geographies, comparing the west to the east side of the state. Now I want to note that this is joint work together with Professor Jerry Simons, and with that I'll start off with our broader healthcare overview. So here what we'll be doing is, as I mentioned, drawn primarily on data coming from the BRFIS, so the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey, and one limitation of this data is that it's based on interviews. So this is going to be self-reported data. And what we'll be doing here in, is to compare the coma, Ken, Ottawa, Muskegon, and Allegan counties, to the Detroit region consisting of Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne counties. And starting off looking at behavioral risk factors and behaviors, um, what we see for obesity is a trend from 2011 through 2017 that has been fairly stable across time at or around 30% of our populations in terms of the overall obesity rates. Now, if we expand this to also take into consideration people that are overweight, so having a BMI of 25 to 30, we're now talking about two-thirds of our population. So if we're looking for areas where we can not only have a direct impact on uh, individuals' health, given the risks of hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, and depression, and many others that might follow on from obesity, this is one that we like to highlight in terms of our reporting. Um, and this is not only an area where we can have uh, an effect on improving individuals' health, but also an area where we can help curb future expenditures related to health care. Turning over to current cigarette smokers. So these are individuals who are reporting having smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their lifetime and are currently smoking either every day or some days. Um, we see two things here in terms of the trend lines. We see that we've been decreasing the number of current smokers across time from 2011 through 2017. And we see that there's a gap that is persistent across this time period with higher smoker prevalence rates when it comes to the Detroit population compared to our coma region. Um, now, we're cautious about reading too much into these trends. Yes, they're moving in the right direction. We're reducing those rates. If we compare to the national average in 2017, it would be right around here about 17 percent. So with Coma outperforming the national average, but the Detroit region not outperforming the national average, and the state as a whole not outperforming this, the national average. So there's still room on a state level here to do more and to improve when it comes to current smokers. And a thing that we are particularly interested in is to see whether or not some of these trends are driven with regards to possible substitution patterns. So one thing that might be occurring is that we're having smokers substitute away from tobacco and over to um, e-cigarette use and vaping products. Now, if you look at the coma and the Detroit region combined on the very far right here, we're talking roughly about 5% of our adult populations. So that's with emphasis on adult populations because as the CDC has noted with recent reporting with regards to the youth tobacco surveys that have come out, um, if you're looking at high school students, we're talking about close to one in five, in fact over one in five in terms of the prevalence in high schools. So this, we can't say too much this year because we're establishing <coughs> the baseline, but we're hoping to build on this so we can have trends to compare the smoking rates and also the e-cigarette use in years to come and potentially expand this to other populations such as the younger populations too in our reporting. Now we want to switch over from health behaviors and take a look at um, healthcare access. 
So on the graph here, we're looking at 18 to 64 year olds who report having had no health insurance in the past year. And as we see here, these trends have been decreasing across time, meaning that more and more individuals report actually having health insurance. And it's not too surprising with the trend starting around 2014 with the rollout of our health exchanges and with the um, push out of our Medicaid expansion in terms of the Healthy Michigan Initiative. So we've had more individuals actually gain access to health insurance and with that we might anticipate some positive spillover effects in terms of fewer individuals potentially reporting not being able to access health care due to cost and we see some of this in the data. So this is the proportion of our populations reporting having no health care access in the last year at some, at some time in some event due to cost being a hindrance. So while the trend is not as downward as we would like, overall, looking from about 2013 forward, we see that the trend for both regions has been to move downward somewhat. Turning to individuals having a usual source of care, so a primary care provider that they can go to when they need care, we see a rather positive trend here from 2013 and onwards. So from 2013 to 2015, we see across both Coma and Detroit that more individuals report having a usual source of care. Now that's leveled off somewhat, so we'll have to continue to, to track this, but we've moved in the right direction, and in coma, we're outperforming the national average in terms of how we're doing with regards to usual source of care. Now one area where we see a really positive trend is with regards to having had a routine checkup in the past year. So here, we're moved from about 67% for the combined coma and Detroit regions up to about 75% in 2017. So a really positive development in terms of the potential health benefits that might come from an early diagnosis and from early treatment with regards to um, things you might find out during your checkup. Now a big question is, does the fact that we have more insurance and the fact that we have more access and we have a primary care physician and we have routine checkups translate into us self-reporting feeling better? And unfortunately, if we look at the coma region, we don't see that this has necessarily made a huge dent in terms of how people self-report about their health. That has remained fairly stable for looking at coma. And if you look at Detroit, in fact, it seems like it's been going, getting worse across time with more and more individuals reporting the lower categories of fair or poor health when asked to self-evaluate their health status. Now, new this year, we also include information with regards to mental health status. So here, an individual is asked uh, to, this is going to be looking at the percentage of the population that report 14 or more days in the past 30 days that they had so-called poor mental health days. So days filled with high levels of anxiety, stress, depression. And this has remained fairly stable across time here between 12 and 13 percent, although we do note from 2015 and onwards a slight uptick and a consistent upward trend here. Also new this year is data relating to opioid prescription dispensing. Now here I want to start at a very, very peak here in looking at the coma region. Here we're talking about one and a half opioid prescription being dispensed per capita per year. So this is 2013. Now in a, what's been very positive is that since then we've been moving to come down considerably, down to about 0.6 per capita in 20, 2015, and that has leveled off since. Looking at Detroit, since about 2012, 2011, we've had a similar downward trend. So really uh, holding back and decreasing the opioids being prescribed and dispensed in this case. Now a natural question is to ask, has this had an effect on the drug overdose deaths that we see take place? These are the wider overall drug overdose deaths, not just related to opioids. But the answer here, unfortunately, is no. So looking at the trends here, we have increasing trends for both the coma and the Detroit regions. Looking at coma, it's a slightly different trend from 2014 and onwards, with a slight leveling off, where the opposite is seen when it comes to Detroit, where we actually have an increasing rate year on year that seems to be growing faster. A similarly um, negative trend is seen when we take a look for the first time this year on deaths from suicide. So here we've moved from about nine individuals per 100,000 in our populations dying from suicide in 2000, all the way up to about 13 of our populations dying from suicides in 2017. 
So another negative um, trend that we wish to draw attention to in terms of our reporting. For the second part, I'm going to draw on a new data set, which is going to be primarily from the American Hospital Association. And what we're going to be doing here is to look at the broader Grand Rapids metropolitan areas, uh, which is going to be Grand Rapids here in dark blue. And we're going to compare it to a set of benchmark communities consisting of Buffalo, New York, Rochester, New York, um, Louisville, Kentucky, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So what we're doing is we're taking a weighted average in terms of the metrics that we're looking at here for those four communities. Now they were selected on the basis of having a similar population makeup, similar earnings distributions. So they are similar enough to be a good benchmark to our local communities. And we also have the U.S. national average and the Detroit um, MSA that we also look at here across time. So the first thing that we look at here is hospitals admissions per capita, so per 1,000 individuals. And what's important to keep in mind here with regards to how the American <coughs> Hospital Association reports their data is that in the numerator, we're looking at overall admissions. So if we're looking at Grand Rapids, for instance, we not only take into consideration the admissions that come from within Grand Rapids, we also look at admissions that come from outside of Grand Rapids. We divide this by the population in Grand Rapids. So if we are attracting a lot of people from out of outside the region, this might lead to overstating of some of these metrics that we're going to be looking at. Now, what's um, and we've been careful about this, so we've looked into it, and what we find in terms of like trend lines for inpatient care is that about 20% of all patients tend to come from outside the Grand Rapids area. Now, what's important for looking at trends is that that has been fairly consistent and stable across time, so that should not be affecting some of these trend lines that we're actually seeing here and report on in terms of the health check. So starting looking at hospital admissions, um, we are consistently having fewer hospital admissions than our comparison group in terms of a benchmark. Now, that can be viewed as a positive marker in terms of how expensive hospital admissions tend to be. Um, it could be driven by us potentially providing care in alternative settings, and I'll provide some details on this later. So if we provide more of our care in outpatient care facilities, for instance, which are less resource intensive and less costly, that can be a good uh, indicator in terms of how we're dealing with costs in our local communities. Now, one potential side effect with regards to having fewer admissions is that we might have to spread some of the costs that we have related to actually treating our patients across fewer individuals. So if you're looking at the graphs here, we see an overall increasing trend in terms of hospital expenses per admission. And what I really want to underscore here is that when we say expenses, we're talking about costs from the perspective of the hospital. So these are data that comes from hospital cost reports reported to the CMS, um, and not about expenses borne by the end consumer. So since about 2010, we've consistently had higher expenditures per admission than our benchmarks. Potential drivers of this might be due to the fact that we have fewer admissions. So when we have admissions, these might be for more hard to treat and more intense uh, cases, um, and which might lead to higher expenditures as a possibility. The overall increasing trend over time, there's been research showing that with new technological adaptions come increasing costs. And that could be one of the expl explanations here, given that we see it also at a national level overall, um, among others. Now, in terms of moving from the inpatient setting over to outpatient care, what we've seen here is a rather dramatic shift from about two visits per capita in Grand Rapids back in 2005, all the way up to about four visits per capita in 2017. Now, something that we um, argue in the report now and have uh, reported on earlier, too, is that we most likely believe that this is due to an alignment between physician practices and hospitals. So with that alignment comes the reclassification and the billing under the outpatient pr perspective payment system, meaning that in terms of the a uh, American Hospital Association data, you would be classified if you went to your physician office as having had an outpatient visit instead of a um, physician office visit in this case. Why do we believe that this might be driving it and why might we not believe that we're just doubling our utilization of care? Well, we might have had some of this increase come from the fact that we have low admission rates. That is a possibility. But we think that this is the case because if you look at the benchmark and you look at the national trends, 
they have not had these trends. It's mainly centered and, and focused on Grand Rapids and on the Detroit area where we see these trends happening. So that's the basis for our hypothesis here. Relating to the high cost area of treatment with regards to ED visits, um, we have two things to note here. One thing is that it's getting worse across time, and keep in mind that these are all inflation-adjusted numbers, so they're comparable across time. Uh, number two is that in the Detroit region, we have a clear outlier with year-on-year -year higher expenditures than we see on the west side of the state. Um, and given the high cost that we're actually talking about here, this is definitely an area where we can help cut costs if we focus our resources towards this issue. In the last slide, we um, include kind of a quality proxy for the level with which we're able to coordinate our care. So we're looking at ambulatory care sen sensitive discharges here. So meaning uh, discharges from an inpatient care setting um, that could have actually been treated in a less intense setting with regards to outpatient care. So if we have good care coordination, we would assume that we have a low number with regards to the ambulatory care sensitive discharges. And as we see here, Grand Rapids has consistently been outperforming the benchmarks when it comes to the statistic, implying that we most likely have very good uh, care coordination within our community and are able to potentially save a lot of money due to this effect. For the last part, we're going to be drawing on data coming from our community partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Blue Care Network, and Priority Health. And here we're going to be delving into our community's chronic disease burden with regards to um, six chronic conditions, asthma, coronary artery disease, depression, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and lower back pain. And we're also going to have a, a benchmark here in terms of healthy members. So in looking at these trends, um, I want to keep in mind that we're looking at individuals 18 to 64 years of age who are privately insured, so we don't have any Medicaid patients in here and we don't have any Medicare patients. And we're looking 2017 dollars that have been inflation adjusted to 2018 dollars. So we see roughly in the data here some increases for asthma, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, with the clear outlier being with regards to coronary artery disease. Um, between the 2017 and 2018, we saw a 19.4 percent increase with regards to these expenditures. Now, there could be a lot of factors underlying this related to costs, uh, related to price, related to utilization rates, uh, underlying population changes in terms of the, the health makeup of our populations. Um, it could also be that this might be driving, driven by the prescription expenses related to the treatment of these cases. Now, to explore that hypothesis, what we do is decompose the overall expenditures um, to look at, in light blue here, the Rx share of the expenses and compare it to the dark blue consisting of overall medical expenses. And if we do this, we find that the Rx share is fairly consistent across time, both in percentage and, and in overall value, and that mo much of this expenditure increases across the board here appears to be driven by medical expenditures. Now switching away from a temporal view to one where we compare the Coma region and Detroit region, um, we find that for five out of the six chronic conditions, we have higher expenditures in the, in the Detroit area than we do over in the Coma region. The one exception here being with regards to coronary artery disease. So again, what could be driving these potential differences? Maybe there's utilization differences. Well, if you look in the report, we have utilization information with regards to inpatient care, with regards to emergency department care, and we also have information about prescription fills. And these tend to be higher across the board for all six chronic conditions over in Detroit than they are over in the Coma region. Um, it could be with regards to practice patterns and styles and the physician teams that we have on the west and the east side of the state. It could be due to market conditions with regards to competition that might look different on the west and the east side of the state. And it could also have to do with differences in the underlying health of our populations. Now, for the first time this year, we're able to actually explore this hypothesis, the last one with regards to differences related to our underlying population healths, and provide some data in this regard. So if the entire gaps that we're seeing between Coma and Detroit is simply due to population health differences, then we might anticipate that if we adjusted for risk scores for these two populations, that these two would align. And if they align, that would mean that most of that expenditure gap is purely due to um, population, underlying population health differences. 
So when we do this, in the dark blue here, we have the actual comb expenditures from the previous slide. In, in the light blue, we have the actual Detroit expenditures from the previous slide. But in the red here, we have the predicted coma expenditures. If in the coma region, we had a patient population that looked like that over in the Detroit region. So if you look at asthma, for instance, that seems to be the case. We go from the dark blue and the red line increases and it becomes more level with regards to the asthma expenditures. If you look at depression, they appear to be fairly level in terms of the overall levels there. And not exact, but close to level in terms of hyperlipidemia, lower back pain, and with regards to our healthy members. The two outliers here are with regards to coronary artery disease and with regards to diabetes. So for diabetes, and sorry, with regards to coronary artery disease, we do see a movement towards more alignment. So it moves in that direction, but there's still a sizable gap indicating that there's more like, most likely other structural factors that are different between the west and the east side of the state that lead to these expenditure gaps. <coughs> And when we look at diabetes, if once we adjust for the risk scores, the prediction is that we, should actually, that we actually have higher expenditures over on the west side than we do on the east side of the state in terms of our patient expenditures. And the gap that remains after implies that we most likely have other structural differences between the west and the east. Now, as a final um, statistic that we want to look at, is something that we first reported on last year with regards to average annual telehealth visits. So as we mentioned last year, were, these were fairly low and fairly small, um, and they have since then increased considerably in terms of the actual uptake and use rate. So the first thing I want to draw attention to with regards to this graph is that across all six chronic conditions, we have higher utilization in the coma region than we do in the Detroit region. However, in regards to growths and changes from last year, most of that has been experienced in the actual Detroit region, where we've seen most of the significant growth in terms of increased uptake take place over in Detroit. So these are interesting trends that we hope to continue to track, um, especially given the, the promise of not only reaching more individuals and provide care to them uh, in terms of the convenience of this type of care, but also with regards to potential cost savings that might come with regards to higher use of telehealth. So with that, I will pause, and if you have any questions, we would be more than happy to talk about those. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, so one question that I have been given for you, Sebastian, is are we seeing any positive effects from the hospital value-based program on hospital expenditures? Well, with the rollout of the ACA, we've also had the um, rollout of the um, hospital-based, value-based purchasing. And one of the promises of that is to assess hospitals on metrics to do with safety, to do with quality, and to do with um, efficiency in terms of cost efficiency. Um, so we've got a lot of really rich data coming out of this initiative, which will be interesting to look at and hopefully work into the actual report in years to come. With regards to the question of whether or not it has had an impact or one that we can actually see in the data that we have in the report now, um, it's hard to say. So one area where we might expect to see it is with regards to hospital expenditures. So this was the part two that I looked at with regards to the American Hospital Association expenditure data. So we saw a trend that's increasing across time, and we saw that the trend was fairly unchanged in 2014. We didn't see it go down. Now, if it did, that might have been an indication of the fact that the value-based purchasing had had a dent on it. But again, this is not um, a comparative study where we have a control group uh, and a uh, treatment group in terms of evaluating it. But um, just in terms of the, the data that we have, we don't see a huge effect from it in terms of this data. But again, it has limitations in terms of trying to answer this, this question. But it will be something that will be interesting to come back to um, and to include some quality data potentially in our, in our reporting in the future. Another question. Could the coma's higher coronary artery disease be explained by higher access to care versus Detroit? It could. Um, so if we're thinking about total 
expenditures, and we're thinking about that as a function of price and about as a function of quantity, um, either of those two could be driving it. And in the actual report, we provide some evidence against this hypothesis, which is that we see that for inpatient care, for instance, the utilization rates tend to be higher on the uh, Detroit side. If we look at the emergency department use, we also find that these are higher on the Detroit side. And if we look at the prescription fills, these tend to be slightly higher. Um, if we also look at some of the data that we have in a different data set, so not directly comparable, but if you look at it in the American Hospital Association part, the benchmarking part, and you look at outpatient visits, um, this is across all types of care, so it's not just coronary artery disease. But if you look in that part, they're more or less the same in Detroit and in Grand Rapids. Now that's a rough proxy, but at least it leads me to, to believe that um, utilization seems to be fairly similar in that dimension. So while this might be an explanation for that gap, I don't find a lot of evidence in support of it, uh, that it would be purely driven by increased utilization. Um. Opioid prescriptions are decreasing, but opioid deaths are increasing. Do we have a hypothesis in regard to that? So just to clarify, what we were looking at are overall drug-related deaths. So we didn't have the opioid deaths in isolation in terms of our reporting here. Um, so I can't directly speak to, to that trend. Um, we would still hope that if we had this huge of an impact in terms of the reduction of opioid rates, that we might see some reductions in terms of overall drug, expend, uh, drug deaths. The, the fact that we don't seems to imply, at least to me, that there might be some substitution. So if you have a harder time time actually getting opioids from your physician that you previously got it from, you might go off and potentially seek these out in alternative markets. Uh, one question concerning the, uh, the data itself. Uh, some of the data seems to be from a few years ago. Uh, can we explain that? Is there a way to get more recent data? So what we try to do with the health check is to, com to draw together not only primary data. So if you're looking at everywhere where we have like more recent data, that's where we have access to um, individuals and, and organizations such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, Blue Care Network, and Priority Health that are able to give us this newer data directly from them. Whenever you have to deal with secondary data, um, you're, you're on the mercy of receiving that data from the organization itself, and they naturally have to work through kinks on their end, so it just takes longer to before it gets to our end. And also in terms of where we are in, in mm -hmm. terms of the cycle, it doesn't align well with having the 2018 data, for instance, for the Burfus data um, at the local level. So unfortunately, we're doing our best, and if we could, we, we will improve on that, but um, we're, 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 we're doing our best. Uh, CMS has recently been proposing requirements in hospitals to post payer negotiated rates for shoppable services. Uh, what can we expect to happen if these prices become transparent? So last year we had the transparency initiative with regards to charge master prices. So that was the first rollout and if you've seen a lot of organizations put it providing these data um, online, that's that's been an interesting development. Now what's important to make a distinction of is charge master prices which are so-called list prices and negotiated prices. Now the research on charge master prices is not, I would say, hasn't, doesn't have a conclusive conclusion in terms of it being having an effect of increasing or decreasing charge master prices. And naturally, you can imagine that if you realize that you're charging way more than your competitors, you might push down. But if you realize that you're charging way less than your competitors, you might also push up. So the overall average in terms of the distribution might move up, might move down, and it might be market specific. And that's what you find in terms of prior studies that have looked at state level pushouts of these legislations. Now, moving over to negotiated rates, now we're in a really fun place from an economist point of view because um, we're in a fun place because it's a really interesting problem and it's not <coughs> trivial what's going to happen. So um, for a long time we've had uh, most favored nation contracts between insurers and hospitals. And in those contracts, a most favored nation clause would basically state that if you give a better price to anyone else, then you should give that same rate to us in terms of the negotiations. 
Now, price transparency can have the same effect as most favored nations clauses have, which is to actually stall competi competition and to actually lead to higher prices, not lower. And let me give an example. So I give a high price reduction to um, an insurer. I'm a hospital. Now, all of a sudden, that's being transparent. And all the other ones that I'm negotiating with can see that I'm giving them a huge discount. Now, either I have to extend that discount to everyone else in terms of negotiations, or I don't give it in the first place. It's probably easier for me to not give it in the first place. Now, I'm not saying that it will lead to higher prices overall, but it could, and it's a possibility. So therefore, we really have to listen to the research on this topic and look closely on that, because that will be a really, I think it will be very market specific in terms of the overall outcomes that we get. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What impact are overall population trends having on the cost to manage care? So if we're looking, looking at the overall costs um, and we look at the demographics, we didn't have time to include the demographic section here in the presentation here today, but the trends that we're seeing is overall that our populations are becoming older. So we have a direct correlation between age and demand for healthcare services. So naturally with that, that will drive up utilization and in turn drive up ex overall costs for our communities. So that's definitely something that's going on in the background and really important to be mindful of when you're reading this report. Uh, is any of the data allowing us to explore characteristics related to gender, gender identity, race, sexual orientation, things like that? Um, not, not necessarily all, but it could be a possibility with regards to our chronic disease burden to look maybe across uh, gender differences and so forth and explore these in terms of expenditure differences or utilization differences. That could be a possibility that we could um, consider. And uh, is there any analysis on obesity as a chronic disease in coma versus the benchmarks? Oh, um, not that we have and not that I'm aware of. So um, that's a good question. I just don't have a good answer to it. So have to think about that one. Uh, is there any additional analysis or hypothesis concerning the share of cost increases, uh, medical costs increasing, not prescription costs? Um, like I mentioned, um, medical costs, again, the, 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 the laundry list in terms of possibilities here had to do with uh, differences in terms of utilizations going up across time. So this year we could only do the risk score adjustment comparing um, coma in Detroit because we only had this data for 2018. But what would be interesting to have is also have it across years. And if we have it across years, we can investigate whether or not we're having changes in the underlying population health that might drive some of these changes in cost. Um, but what we are able to do now is to look at utilization. Uh, that doesn't seem to change, that it does change quite a bit across year, but not enough to fully explain these expenditure differences across time. Um, and the other thing that we don't know for sure, but is a possibility, is with regards to practice patterns. So there's been an increasing amount of research done that looks at how physicians collaborate in teams and how just by the virtue of how you collaborate, um, you can have cost reductions and quality improvements. So if you look across a region like Michigan and you look at it at a county by county level, you can have huge disparities in terms of health outcomes and in terms of costs simply due to how you actually co collaborate. So the research currently is well, that looks at this talks about in terms of care fragmentation. So if you're a physician working with multiple specialists that are of the same specialty, um, you might not have the opportunity to establish as good of a rapport with those specialists as if you worked with one dedicated specialist for a particular treatment. And that rapport might lead to less information spillage in the process of transferring patients and might lead to less care and utilization because you work closely with that, 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 that provider. So that is just an example where how you collaborate in teams and how you work in terms of practice styles might lead to differences in utilization, which might lead to differences in terms of overall costs that we observe. Okay. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much Thank for you. your questions. Now, the portion of our program is to have our panelists present, um, and I have the 
pleasure of introducing each of these esteemed panelists. As you can see, each panel member has outstanding accomplishments, multiple awards, and an extensive resume. So I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. In order to maximize our time so that you can listen to what they have to say and ask questions, I'm going to give a brief bio sketch for each of them in the order that they will be presenting. So again, jot your uh, questions in, down as we go. The first speaker will, will be Dr. Daryl Albucci. He is the Chief Medical Officer for Spectrum Health and the President of Spectrum Health Medical Group. Spectrum Health is a $6.9 billion not-for-profit integrated health system. In his role as CMO for Spectrum Health, Daryl has responsibility over clinical quality, safety, and patient experience. He also leads the Office of Medical Education and Research. As the president of Spectrum Health Medical Group, which is a multidisciplinary medical practice with more than 1,700 physicians and advanced practice providers, Daryl is responsible for all facets of the operations and <coughs> partnerships. Daryl earned his medical degree, Master's of Business Administration, and Certificate of Biostatistics at the University of Michigan, and a Bachelor's degree in History from the University of California, Los Angeles. Our spe second speaker will be Dr. Ronald Grifka, the Chief Medical Officer for Metro Health, University of Michigan Health System, and brings, he brings two decades of leadership to his role which includes overseeing more than 500 Metro Health physicians. He provides leadership to the medical education and serves as the Chief Clinical Quality Officer for the organization. Before joining Metro at CMO, as the CMO, Grifka was Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Michigan and an attending cardiologist at Mott Children's Hospital. At Mott, he was the Director of Cardiology Outreach for 11 sites across Michigan. Our third speaker will be Dr. Young Kim. He is the president of Mercy Health St. Mary's, which is an integrated healthcare network, a joint commission accredited teaching hospital, and a member of Trinity Health, the country's second largest Catholic healthcare system. Dr. Kim is a board certified medical physician who trained at Johns Hopkins and the University of Michigan, and he earned a master's of business administration degree from Michigan. Our fourth speaker will be Mr. Kent Riddles. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Mary Freebed Rehabilitation Hospital, which offers specialized medical and sports rehabilitation programs for people of all ages and abilities. In Kent's nine years tenure, Mary Freebed has grown from one hospital with 80 beds to a network of 38 hospitals in Michigan and Indiana with over 400 beds serving 635% more people. Kent's education is in engineering and business, and he oversees the largest, one of the largest rehab systems in the United States. Our final speaker will be Robert Gordon. He serves as the director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Michigan's largest state department, leading a team of 14,000 employees. He oversees several of the state's critical programs for residents, including Medicaid, Children's Protective Services, Food Assistance, Public Health, and others. Appointed to his role by the Governor in January 2019, he continues his career in public service that spans many areas of government, including the White House and the U.S. Supreme Court. We will now start with Dr. Elmucci. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I am very excited to be here. Happy New Year, and what a great event already. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about something different. So healthcare, as we saw, has been so much over the years about treatment in the United States, and we all know we can do better and better and better, but ultimately, it's much more than treatment. Spectrum Health over the last year has con kind of gone through a rebirth where we've looked at our mission, pardon me, our mission, our vision, our values, and really trying to focus on having our communities be the healthiest place to be, to live, to work. And when you look at some of the data, it's really a bit humbling. It should cause us all pause. Uh, for those of you that haven't heard this statement, your zip code is more impactful on your long-term health than your genetic code. Just think about that for a second. Ultimately, the social determinants of health 
matter. Mm -hmm. Where you live matters, your education matters, your socioeconomic factors matter. Uh, and we believe that these areas must be addressed as well as treating things like coronary artery disease and diabetes. When you look around the community, we also realize that as phenomenal as our partners are, you need more partners, more collaboration to really impact these things. I'd like to give you a few examples of areas that we've focused. Uh, for those of you that weren't aware, African-American babies had a five-fold increased mortality compared to their Caucasian similar babies uh, a number of years ago in our region. Through the Strong Beginnings program, where we've collaborated with eight community partners, including some of my friends at the table, to really focus on expectant mothers and trying to help them have healthier births, uh, we've narrowed that gap to now be even. So from a five-fold increase to the same, that's a pretty significant change in a relatively short period of time. When you look at our youth, uh, absenteeism in school leads to worse socioeconomic factors as you grow up, leads to worse health and worse health outcomes. We've partnered with the Grand Rapids Public Schools and many other school districts to offer virtual nurses. When we were kids, we probably all saw nurses uh, at our schools. That doesn't happen so much anymore in person. Through technology, as was alluded to earlier, we can make it more convenient, more cost effective, and in doing so, have decreased absenteeism at schools by upwards of 50%. And we hope over time these things help our community. When it comes to collaboration, we need to innovate together. And so the one thing as a doctor, when I was growing up, when I was in training, you always viewed insurance companies as a little bit of the enemy and no offense to any insurer here. And that absolutely is no longer the case anymore. And actually, if anything, insurers have to be our friends and partners. Uh, we're lucky enough at Spectrum Health to have an insurer in the family in Priority Health. And we work every day focusing on high risk populations trying to decrease ER utilization, decrease hospitalizations to save money, but to improve outcomes and have these people be healthier. Uh, we're now working with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan on very similar efforts pertaining to value, speaking to them about hospital at home process projects and all sorts of other areas where we can together decrease the cost of care and improve outcomes. And then partnerships that we have now. So how many of you have ever heard of culinary medicine? Just raise your hand. Oh, actually a lot, that's pretty good. Uh, so again, when I was in training, food was never medicine, food was food. And I think for most people, food still is something that you either like or you need, but you never think of it as medicine. Uh, we believe, and there's science to show this, that what you eat dramatically improves your health, uh, dramatically impacts your health. And when you see those obesity figures, it's stunning. Uh, through the Family Kitchen Rx program, we now take underserved youth and their families and put them through a training program over 12 weeks to learn the right foods that are affordable, uh, learn how to prepare those foods. And we've demonstrated that you can decrease weight and decrease biometric markers like cholesterol significantly in these families while they really enjoy their food. Um, with Grand Rapids Community College, we've partnered on the Secchia Institute, where we actually teach physicians and physicians in training uh, how to think of food as medicine, how to prepare food and choose it themselves so they can teach their patients uh, and not just be uh, deers in a headlight. Food is good, but I don't know what it is. Now they know. Virtual. So we talked about this before. We believe virtual is key not only for convenience, but truly to lower the cost of care and make it easier for people to do the right thing. Uh, we now have 20 specialties that we offer virtual services across our regions and beyond. We put a stake in the ground recently with our primary care programs and said that in three years, we want 50% of eligible primary care visits to be virtual. We think that will lower the cost. We think that will make it easier for people to seek the right care. Uh, and then mental health is a, an epidemic in our society. We all know this, and access to mental health services has been very problematic for many. We've now partnered with, Crine, pardon me, with Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services to do teletherapy so people can have therapy in their homes. That decreases the stigma and improves access. Uh, surgery, no one ever thinks of surgery and smiles because it's never fun. However, People probably don't realize that when you go for an operation, it's somewhat akin to your body of running a marathon. There are huge stressors 
at play when you have surgery and you should be prepared for a marathon i hope you should definitely be prepared for surgery and so what we now have is a surgical optimization center where we look together and partner with primary care physicians surgeons and patients to optimize people before their elective surgeries we've now demonstrated that in doing this for total joint surgery that patients who go through this center in this process their costs are decreased by over $1,700 for the same episode than if they didn't. You might ask why. A huge portion of that is decreased lengths of stay after the procedure, and a big portion of it is actually decreased unnecessary testing before. So better outcomes at lower cost are good for all. Babies, see a tiny little foot there. Uh, we now screen for rare genetic diseases in tiny little neonates that are born with significant problems that otherwise we never understood. Uh, this really changes the game. We've proven that we can decrease cost, decrease length of stay, improve outcomes. And actually an amazing story of collaboration was our medical geneticist, Dr. Caleb Bupp, found a gene in a young baby that had never been identified to cause disease before. He tried to understand what happened, what was happening with this baby. It just turns out that three-tenths of a mile down the street at MSU's research center, Dr. Andre Bachman had been studying that same gene for 25 years, not knowing if it was ever going to be associated with the disease. They happened to meet, and lo and behold, the Bachman-Bupp syndrome. It's been published. There are now many babies across the world uh, that have been diagnosed with this, and there's actually a trial proposed for treatment. And ultimately, all of this comes back together with our new vision statement, which is personalized health made simple, affordable, and exceptional. Uh, and I very much want to emphasize that word affordable. And when we talk to Priority Health, we talk to Blue Cross, we talk to our patients, our consumers, the goal now is to really focus on providing the best value. And, and to do so, it's not just going to be about decreasing the cost of the services that all of us deliver, but it's going to be about addressing those social determinants of health to truly impact outcomes. So we're very excited to be here. We're very excited to participate with our friends, with our colleagues, our collaborators, and I look forward to great talks by my friends here. Thank you very much. Good morning. As uh, Jean said, I'm Ron Grifka, a pediatric cardiologist by training, but chief medical officer at Metro Hospital. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in the symposium today. Um, as we thought about it, the role of healthcare organizations in the country today came to mind that there are really three pillars of great healthcare organizations. Number one, and priority, is excellence in clinical care. Number two, we need to train healthcare providers, and providers is plural. It's not just physicians; it's nurses, it's therapists, medical assistants, even administrators. We have to generate the next generation of people to take care of us as we get older. Lastly, it really has to continue to advance research. Now, why do I say that? Imagine where we'd be without vaccines, without antibiotics, hip and joint replacements, pacemakers, stents. So again, it's really important we have all three of these for all healthcare systems as we go through these changing times to focus on these three pillars. Because if you're just looking at one thing, let's say excellence in clinical care, are you really looking to be successful from a societal perspective or are you just looking to be profitable? Again, all are important, but there's three pillars that we really need to focus on to make sure we advance health care in the future. Is health care changing? Well, I think this is an interesting uh, advertisement I saw a few years ago in a magazine. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And fortunately, we don't see many more doctors smoking camels, so I think we made good progress. I think the bigger question really is how fast is health care changing? And there are some current changes we're seeing now in healthcare. You can go in any hospital and there's fewer inpatient procedures, more 23-hour observation procedures where after the procedure you stay there for a day and you're gone. In fact, we're also seeing less of those observation procedures, more outpatient procedures. Knees and hips are now going to be outpatient if they're not there already. Well, that's going to change follow-up since if you're not in the hospital as long, you're going to need additional follow-up. Is that going to be in an office with a doctor or with a nurse? Is it with a telephone call or is it a telemedicine? So you can lots of changes as we develop the system. We've got some more advanced imaging procedures. Uh, MRI elastography gives some beautiful information about liver and liver disease. We've got PET and SPECT imaging. They can give us great anatomic uh, information about tissues, organs, masses, tumors, all non-invasively. Uh, and we also have more chronic medical maintenance therapies. Now, what do we mean by that? Now, back in the old days, not that long ago, but you could, if you had cancer, you got radiation and chemotherapy, either you were cured or you didn't. Uh, nowadays, with the cancer, even other immunology diseases such as lupus. We can contain your disease, we can palliate it with medication. 
Now you might need these medications for once a day, once a week, once a month, but we can contain this disease for months, even years, even decades. Heart failure, if we can't do a bypass or a transplant, we can now put a pump in you. The pump can prolong your life for uh, years. The problem with those last two points is they're really expensive. And we all know someone has to foot the cost of our health care. Then our patients are inundated with commercials as we see the tennis player who can't raise a racket. Well, he, she gets her monthly injection and she's playing on the circuit, right? And Phil Nicholson tells us if we get, uh, go talk to a rheumatologist, we'll be playing golf like him every weekend. So again, these are expensive long-term therapies. They're going to change health care. Um, as I thought about this, looked at the healthcare care systems a few, about just over a year ago. Uh, of course, I work at University of Michigan and Metro Health. But there are at least 14 other healthcare care systems in our state. And even since I made this slide just over a year ago, there's been some affiliation uh, with Lakeland and Spectrum and a few others. But healthcare care analysts tell us in the next three to eight years, there's going to be five, maybe six, maybe four healthcare care systems. So we're going to see more affiliations, more merge, more acquisitions. That's certainly going to affect the way we deliver health care. Uh, I think there's going to be some upcoming changes in health care. There's an election coming up, and I won't get into the politics of it, but I'm sure you can imagine that's going to, could change health care dramatically. Is the ACA going to survive? Are there be changes to it and be repealed? Um, so I think successful health care systems are going to realize that to provide better and more affordable health, affordable health care, they're going to have to work collaboratively on some diseases, especially the diseases that are less common. But health, we should still continue to work competitively on common diseases to so make sure patients have good access, good results, at affordable costs. So I'd like to give a couple examples of collaboration. Um, how about a statewide collaboration, the whole state of Michigan? Most of the hospitals that perform these procedures uh, are part of a collaborative and part of it sponsored by Blue Cross, actually. We send our results to Blue Cross and they look at our length of stay, our complications, our readmission rates. And then they publish them. We, all the hospitals can look at it, patients can look at them. And as you can imagine, if you're ranked high, that's a good thing. If you're not ranked very high, a lot of patients and other people aren't going to be very impressed about that. You're not going to get patients to go there. Well, there's also a special incentive, the so-called P4P, or pay for performance, that a number of insurance carriers will actually reimburse you higher if you're a good performing institution and lower if you're less. So now you hit it with the pocket, hit it where it hurts. Again, this, and this is providing better patient care uh, at more affordable costs. Uh, how about regional collaboration? This was just announced last month. Um, the Trinity Healthcare System, uh, Mercy and St. Mary's are going to work with the University of Michigan Metro to develop a cancer network of West Michigan. So instead of us competing, having three small programs and having difficulty to support each program at each institution, we'll work together and have certain uh, programs at each hospital so we can recruit good physicians, good nurses, good teams to provide the best cancer care. Also, this will be working in conjunction with the University of Michigan Ann Arbor so a lot of their research therapies and uh, medicines that they've got will be able to be directly accessible to our patients here in West Michigan without having to go anywhere else. Uh, not that this one's been an infomercial, but we do have an obesity symposium coming up in May. We've certainly heard from everybody that uh, obesity is an epidemic, and I think uh, Mr. Kessler talked about it last year, uh, what an epidemic it is. But what we're going to do is we're going to have physicians from Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, and all over West Michigan to talk in the whole day symposium to ed educate ourselves and others about obesity. We're going to have people to talk about the cardiovascular effects of obesity, heart attacks, strokes, talk about the orthopedic injuries, uh, joints, uh, mobility, uh, women's health with uh, reproductive capabilities what happens with obesity, also sleep apnea, some psychology issues, and we'll talk about medical and surgical therapies for obesity. And the last thing I'd like to show you is I have to, I'm a pediatric cardiologist, if I didn't say something about kids, I'd be remiss in my duties. So trust me, this is a normal heart. There's four chambers, there's two big blood vessels, there's red blood, blue blood. That's where your heart's supposed to look. Well, in about one out of 100 kids, that's not the way it's formed. And this is my friend Rory, who would probably be my most favorite patient in the whole world if his dad didn't root for this community college in Ohio. <laughs> be that as it may, take care of Rory anyway. Anyway, Rory was sent to see me, and just a nice example of collaboration. So we saw him, did an exam, did an ultrasound, and his heart was not quite normal. In fact, this is Rory's heart. And in Twitter terms, this is what I call an OMG heart. Because it's a high constellation of very complex defects. And after 20 years of doing this, I'd never seen this constellation of defects before. So I said, hmm, wait a minute, family. Walked out of the room, uh, called my colleagues up at the University of Michigan at Mott Hospital, and I sent the le images electronically to Mott. 
There are four doctors looked at it, and they said, God, Ron, this is unusual. We haven't seen this before either. Oh, by the way, we've got two of our heart surgeons here. So they had six doctors in Ann Arbor and myself on the phone talking about uh, this anatomy. We've made a few tweaks, but we came up with a definitive diagnosis and a definitive treatment, which is going to include medicine for about a month or two in their open heart surgery. But it gave us the opportunity to go back to that family and tell them exactly that, your diagnosis and your treatment plan. They didn't have to go to any more tests. They didn't have to go to any other clinic visits. They didn't have to leave the city. So again, with institutions working collaboratively, it can be very helpful uh, to patient care, more efficient and better results. And with that, I thank you for your time, thank you for your attention, and we we'll close the symposium. Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Hyung Kim, and I'm tickled to be with you and sharing with you the Mercy Health uh, perspective on trends in healthcare. I'm just, um, since I'm a relative newcomer too, having started in May, wanted to know how many of you he were here at last year's event? How, how many of you? Um, that's great, because um, I want to start with last year's event, because at last year's event, as some of you may remember, um, one of the speakers was the Trinity Health Michigan CEO, and he asked a few of these questions. Um, is our new favorite term, population health, about economics or about truly improving health? And he also asked, you know, hey, are we really kind of serious about this? Is this just kind of the, the latest buzzword? And are we really um, selling the product that our patients want and need? And I can tell you that um, having learned what I've learned over these past few months, at Mercy Health, we've been very intentional about improving health and about serving people in the way they want and in the way that they need. And I want to share with you uh, today what that looks like and what some of the results have been so far. Now, you know, the reason uh, we do this is that for Mercy Health and Trinity Health, our mission and our core values really drive what we do. And our mission and our core values, as you can see, um, really call us to do this. And it leads us to a, a vision um, that's really about being the national leader in improving health in a way that allows us to be the most trusted health partner for life. And so in terms of the specific strategies around this, there really are four. And the first one, which is kind of a common theme, is around partnering and partnering well. Now, you know, on this, on this page, you see just some of the partners that um, we as Mercy Health have had the benefit of working with over the years. And we've tried very hard to put this in alphabetical order and to size all the logos so that they're <laughs> roughly speaking the same size. Um, the other thing is, I, you know, I want you to see that important partners that are not on here are there are a number of independent physician practices and providers in West Michigan. It's part of what makes our region special and I think better. Um, they are not on this page just because there are so many. And the other part of it is there are partners and teams within these teams that we're not able to put here. But I hope this gives you a sense for, you know, just the breadth and how seriously we take partnering. Um, the second strategy really is around actually being high quality and health cost and, you know, at being high quality and low cost. And there are a lot of ways to, to do it. And so just wanted to share with you that, you know, among the 2019 Priority Health Quality Award recipients, almost three quarters were Mercy Health Physician Partners Practices. That's our, that's our medical group. And among uh, the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan patient-centered medical home designations for that same year, over two-thirds were, again, our practices. And if we look on the hospital side, you know, the Mercy Health Hospitals in West Michigan all are leapfrog gr grade A for patient safety and either CMS four or five star for quality. So, you know, from a quality standpoint, we feel like we're doing well so far. We're really taking it seriously and having some success. In terms of being low cost, a really good high level way to look at it is just look at the total cost of care um, and compare it with um, both the West Michigan average, which is in the middle, and the Michigan average, which is on the right. And you see on the left hand side our Affinia, which is our clinically integrated network, you see that our total cost of care is lower. And so our strategy number two around being high quality and low cost, still work to do, um, but having good early success. To give you an example of that, this is just a goal that our organization set uh, last year around improving blood pressure control to become less than 140 over 90 in at least 80 percent of our hypertensive patients uh, age 18 to 85 by the end of the fiscal year. And um, you can see that we started out somewhere below 75 percent. And uh, if you look back on the left-hand side of the green line, you see that we're there and we're tailing upwards. And I can tell you that our practice has set an even higher goal for this year. 
The third strategy as a Catholic health uh, organization is really to embrace our sin, um, which is to say our clinically <laughs> integrated network. And then, you know, and um, so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to recover from that joke too, <laughs> a little bit. Um, the, uh, and, and remember, the clinically integrated network is a regulatory compliant way that hospital systems and non-employed physician practices can work together to improve quality and cost. And you see on the left hand side what the characteristics of our Affinia Health Network clinically integrated network is. Now what we can share with you data wise is that, you know, broadly writ, our uh, Affinia Health Network uh, touches about 400,000 lives on an annual basis. And, um, and of those, 267,000 uh, are attributed to us, which is to say they have a primary care physician who is an Affinia Health Network primary care physician. And of those, um, the vast majority, 222,000, are in APM or alternative payment model uh, lives, which is to say we are not only saying we're responsible for the cost and the quality of care, we have a financial stake in it with upside. And then of those 88,000, we also have downside risk which is to say that if we don't achieve the goals, then, you know, financially that hurts us as an organization. Uh, and so we really are embracing it. And the other evidence of that is we embrace it even when it challenges hospital finances. And that's important because today in U.S. healthcare, it's hospital finances that still fund, you know, everything that we're able to do. And so, you know, when you look at emergency department visits per thousand, inpatient admissions, imaging some key areas, for us, these are all lower than our comparatives, and we still believe in uh, embracing our sin, um, even though it challenges us on the hospital side. Now, the fourth strategy, and finally, is really around the social influences of health, and you know, this is kind of a different uh, uh, treatment for the three primary areas that kind of um, fall outside the genetics and the traditional sick care, and um, we're intentional about those, and this is, again, an area we're partnering well <laughs> Um, is especially required. And so, you know, to bring it back to the beginning of this and reviewing these questions from last year, we did want to show that, hey, you know, those questions from last year were kind of rhetorical for us because we're partnering um, with anyone who believes in what we believe in who wants to partner with us to improve quality, lower cost, and take more financial risk to genuinely improve the health of the communities that we serve. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Just really delighted to be here. Thank you all for, uh, for coming. Uh, everyone in this room ha is, has been involved in healthcare, is going to be involved in healthcare, uh, or, uh, or was involved in healthcare. And so we all have the same interest. We, uh, at Mary Freebed, we have a little different philosophy. Uh, we partner with all of these, uh, certainly these providers and payers uh, and the state. Uh, but we uh, have a philosophy of medicine that I think is at its golden era now in uh, healthcare in, in the United States. So I'm going to talk about that. I'll give you just a couple of minutes on uh, what Mary Freebed is doing to contribute to this in partnership with others, and then uh, get to uh, five challenges that we see in uh, our healthcare, and then get to the most important thing for opportunities and then I'll sit down. Uh, Sebastian, it was great. Uh, so we started with a Purdue economics expert, uh, other than uh, Director Gordon, of course, from that place called Harvard and Yale. Uh, we get to end with a Purdue engineer, and uh, that, that my, my credentials for being up here is merely that I'm a construction engineer. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any. Uh, it's good, I think, with our interest. Let's start with just, uh, this is about 40 seconds. I want to tell you about a story. This is uh, both collaborative. This, uh, this is what we're here for, and it's really about outcome. Clementine um, had uh, cervical uh, work because she had a separation of her skull from her spine in an accident and stretched the cord, came to Mary Freebed with total paralysis on a ventilator, uh, after her surgery, which was um, fantastic surgery. This is a story of Clementine. Even before the accident, I, I was wanted to run a marathon. That's always been my goal. When I was an inpatient and when I started outpatient therapy, I, was, uh, I could only walk, but now I'm running. 
having them keeping me accountable and reminding me to do my exercises and stressing the importance of doing the exercises uh, only encouraged me to even work harder. It's worth every doubt, sweat, tear, um, everything. It's worth, the feeling is worth all the hard work. You will see me crossing um, the finish line this, uh, this May at the Riverbank. I'm doing the 10K with my friends. Um, and then maybe one day you see me crossing the finish line in Chicago Marathon in like five years or something. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Uh, it, this is a... Uh, that is a woman who literally lost her head. Uh, so our mission is restoring hope and freedom through rehabilitation. That means function and independence. That means getting people off of the dole, the financial dole that is health care. Uh, it's getting people back, like Clementine, to the th kind of things they want to do. Our goal, simply, at Mary Freebed is to be the leader in the field, in the world, in both post-acute services as well as pre-acute services, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Physical medicine rehabilitation is our medical specialty. We teach it at Mary Freebed. It is the uh, process of restoring function, getting people back to the things that they want to do after birth defects, pain, trauma, uh, post-surgical complications, uh, nearly every disease. Uh, this was Mary Freebed for 120 years prior to 2011. Mary Freebed is the oldest remaining hospital in Michigan. We were the children's hospital at one time. We were the polio hospital at one time. And in 2011, after uh, some changes, this is Mary Freebed today. We served, uh, last year, we served about 65%, two-thirds of all the catastrophic injuries in the state in one of our care sites. Uh, so as a statewide provider, I don't know that geographically there is a larger one, uh, and we continue to grow. You see some of, uh, but eight of the 14 health systems that were mentioned earlier are our partners, including, of course, everybody at the table here. Uh, this is Mary Freebed in the future. This is where we're going. We have uh, teams actually today out of the state lines working. Uh, and what's important, I think, for the coma area is that uh, we are bringing quaternary patients not only worldwide back to Grand Rapids and their families, but we're bringing them back from a much greater region, uh, both uh, all of the United States and then certainly from the Midwest. Uh, by the numbers, we're small compared to our, we're small but mighty in our field, one of the largest, if not the largest on the, in the, on the planet in what we do, uh, a few thousand caregivers, uh, these are employed physicians, certainly not those that are on staff, that's a much greater number. Uh, we are on a diversity, equity, and inclusion march, and the reason is that we are taking care of 25% uh, people of color as an example, and our caregivers need to reflect that community because the evidence is very clear that, that people respond better to those that they connect with. And so that is a very important initiative for Mary Freebed. We serve a lot of people. This has been growing at about a rate of about 20% a year uh, for the last nine years. Uh, more programs than any other rehab rehabilitation provider uh, in the country. As I mentioned, we teach uh, PM&R medicine we also are the division, very proud to be the division of, of uh, rehabilitative medicine for the state of Michigan for Michigan State. We also collaborate with, in research with the uh, University of Michigan and others. Uh, these are total students. This was actually a couple years old. It's a much bigger number now. This is only at the Grand Rapids campus. Uh, with all of our campuses, it's a much greater number. Um, Jean, Philomena, most of these are Lakers. <laughs> and. Uh, I took Tom Haas around Mary Freebed a few years ago, and uh, I just couldn't believe all the high fives <laughs> from Lakers. It was wonderful. Five big challenges, really simply. Uh, they've really all been mentioned, but uh, maybe this is just the way I look at them. Uh, we, we, as, these, as providers, as vendors, as everyone involved in healthcare, we're reacting to disease rather than promoting health. So do we really call ourselves health systems or do we call, we certainly are health care providers, but are we health systems? And I think in the future, the only way to really crack this nut is to get at this issue about promoting health. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, it's been said uh, very well that uh, we are becoming sicker and more depressed as, uh, as a population. We're spending too much money to be able to treat that uh, depression and sickness 
And uh, as a group of healthcare, uh, the healthcare industry, we're, we're still too self-serving. I mean, I would admit I'm still in Washington lobbying for money for rehabilitation, mm -hmm. even when I think that uh, there's too much money being spent. Um, uh, but let's get to the opportunities. Uh, certainly lifestyle, that's been said. Uh, I mentioned pre-acute services. Uh, we think this is really where it's at. This is the biggest way to bend the needle in the United States. Uh, we are in a wired society. Uh, the, even the federal government agrees that 30 to 40 percent of all health care is unnecessary. We would agree at Mary Freebed, and uh, certainly data informatics and machine learning is going to be the way of the future to improve quality, efficiency, and safety. Uh, starting with lifestyle, if 30, 360 million Americans would wake up tomorrow morning and dump the sugar, don't eat any of it, don't eat anything on here, I think the only thing that's of value here is the fork, the knife, and the plate. Maybe a little of the lettuce and the burger, but um, that and if they could go out and walk and run, we would see a vastly different uh, world in what we do. Uh, what do consumers want? They want it now. They want it where they are at. They want it. Uh, they want to use their devices. Frankly, they don't even want to come talk to a human being if they don't have to. They want to pay the lowest cost possible, especially now if with the way uh, they are now responsible for it. And they want control and information and transparency. This is no different than any other industry. This is certainly where the population is going. And they want to do it through that great device called our smartphone. And it is going to bowl over healthcare, we believe, in the next 10 years. Uh, interestingly enough, you think of something like uh, we, something we do, a lot of, uh, physical therapy. We're doing this uh, through the web uh, on FaceTime. The computer can measure range of motion, velocity, uh, pressures, uh, things that you cannot do in person. And so machine learning really, uh, we believe, is the future. Less is more. This was a woman who came uh, and presented with back pain, uh, not here in Michigan, this was elsewhere for the very first time, and this is the result. This is uh, peer-reviewed, it's been vetted, everybody agrees this was an absolute sin. This is somebody who wasn't even triaged into a more conservative program of physical therapy before this was attempted, uh, so now that's for the rest of her life. Uh, and uh, the Duke study on depression. Uh, this is the Duke study, pretty clear. I don't know how many are aware of it, but uh, if everybody would go for a jog instead of taking their depression meds, which I think the country, something like a quarter of the country is on depression medications, uh, then the evidence is that they would do a lot better. Uh, and then finally, the amount, of, the amount of data that is available is just <laughs> growing beyond our wildest imaginations. The problem, of course, is how do you synthesize that data and turn it into something that we can use? Uh, this is, uh, the, the possibilities are endless with this. Uh, again, another example uh, with this x-ray where the machine can do a lot more finite, a lot more qualitative measuring and assessment than a human being could ever do. Again, let's not forget you and I and everybody here are here for Clementine and that uh, we want to see her five years from now run that Chicago Marathon, like she said. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want you to know uh, this is my first anniversary in my role as director of MDHHS. And I looked it up. First anniversary is, is usually celebrated with paper, and I'm here to tell you I have a lot of paper already. <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you. I, I'm grateful for the incredibly warm welcome that my family and I have received in Michigan, including in West Michigan. No one would come to me for, for the outlook of health care in, in Michigan or in the United States, but what I think I can share is the outlook for MDHH, MDHHS and our department. I'll talk to you a little bit about what we are doing with an emphasis on the we because there is nothing we do at MDHHS that we don't do in partnership, including in partnership with the amazing leaders who, who are here today. Um, our vision is to deliver health and opportunity with an emphasis on reducing disparities and addressing intergenerational poverty. There are four pillars of our approach. 
I'll talk briefly about a couple and then deep dive in a few areas. Giving all kids a healthy start, we are in particular focused on the challenge of lead for young people in Michigan. We are aggressively implementing the new lead testing under the new lead and copper rule. We'll be talking about some exciting initiatives to address lead not only in water but in housing and soil. We are very focused on improving outcomes uh, for kids who are at risk of entry or enter into our child welfare system, which has been in court receivership for 13 years. We see some exciting positive trends. The number of kids who are in foster care is below 13,000 for the first time in three years. We're seeing positive movement in levels of abuse, neglect, fatalities. We're working very hard to improve that system. And there's wonderful stuff happening in this part of the state, actually. Uh, we're working hard to provide stability for families economically and to make it as easy as possible to get benefits from the department. Too often it is a maze, it is time consuming, it is exhausting for families. And it is part of the work of addressing social determinants of health is to enable families to get access to the nutrition, to the housing assistance, and of course to the health insurance that they are entitled to. A few months ago we announced a change in the asset tests in Michigan to make it easier for folks to get benefits and to speed up the process, and we're excited about where that is. Uh, I'll talk now in more detail about our efforts around uh, serving the whole person and uh, three areas in particular. Uh, first, I, I feel some obligation just to touch on Medicaid work requirements, which are now in effect here in Michigan. Um, I, I will be candid, and I think you all know this, these are not requirements that this governor supports. We do not believe and we think there is robust evidence to suggest that health insurance is life-saving for folks and that work requirements are not actually effective in supporting self-sufficiency. That having been said, the law is the law and we are doing absolutely everything in our power to implement it effectively and in a way that preserves health coverage for as many people as possible. The legislature passed some measures over the summer that reduced the number of people to whom work requirements apply. We were grateful for that. We are working very hard in particular on the simplification and streamlining of our communications. And so we have dramatically changed the letters and the way that we talk to folks so that things are as simple as possible. They're in language that connects with people, that folks understand. And that work is all out in the community today. And um, we're doing the best that we can. There's also, um, I guess part of the outlook here is there's litigation that's pending on this and we'll see what happens with that. Next, I wanna talk about what we are doing around the opioid crisis. It would be impossible to overstate the depth uh, and the tragedy of the opioid crisis. Five people a day on average in Michigan are losing their lives to opioids. You can see on this graph the trends historically where we had first growth around prescription medication, OxyContin, which was not well managed. By the time it was managed, we had significant growth in heroin addiction, and then in recent years, we have had growth in fentanyl. And uh, it, is, it is an overwhelming tragedy. A little bit of good news in 2018 as the numbers began to come down, but also then saw uh, another disturbing trend, which was rising racial disparities. 5% reduction in deaths in 2018 among whites, 20% increase in deaths among African Americans. Governor Whitmer has announced a goal of a 50% reduction in opioid deaths in five years. That is an ambitious goal, but it's one that we think we can achieve. These are the elements of our strategy. I'm not gonna walk through every one of them, but I will pull out some highlights. I will say a cross-cutting theme here is doing what works, not doing what we might wish would work, not saying the things that we think might make us feel good, but looking at the evidence and doing what will matter most. At the left, you see the elements of a traditional public health strategy, which we are applying, prevention, education efforts, making sure that every doctor is following guidelines around opioid prescriptions and that they are checking before they prescribe against MAPS, against our data systems. When it comes to treatment, getting opioid treatment, medication-assisted treatment to where people are, out to doctors, to hospitals, we eliminated in Medicaid prior authorization requirements to make it easier for folks to prescribe. 
harm reduction, getting naloxone as widespread as we possibly can. Uh, we're getting it to folks when they leave prison now as they walk out the door. Um, safe syringe programs. I'm actually, when I leave here, I'm going to vi visit uh, the Red Project here in Grand Rapids. Great evidence around the effectiveness of safe syringe programs. We want to double, double the number in Michigan in 2020. Specific efforts around folks in the criminal justice involved population. We're working with the Department of Corrections to implement MAT in every facility in the next few years. Pregnant and parenting moms, getting treatment to them, making sure, and again, there's been pioneering work here in the Grand Rapids area, making sure that we do not precipitously remove kids from their parents if we can treat them effectively where they are. And then, as I said, dealing with the growing disparity challenge that we have in the state and getting resources to where we see those gro that growth and disparity. Last area I want to talk about is one that's been in the news a little bit. It's, it's probably our major legislative effort this year, and it is one that builds on years of effort in the state. And this is the effort to improve the way that we deliver behavioral health for 300,000 Michiganders. Um, Michigan has so much to be proud of in its behavioral health system, in a strong community-based system, in effective deinstitutionalization, which many states have not achieved, in strong legal protections for individuals, for person-centered planning, for self-determination, for community-based care. But at the same time, we have real challenges. I don't need to tell you this. Folks can't access the care that they want. If they're unhappy with their care, they don't have alternative <laughs> choices. There are challenges around bureaucracy and red tape at every level of the system, whether it is families, whether it is providers. And I think most fundamentally, the opportunity we have in a world of extremely tight resources, and I, I can't emphasize that enough, I would, there's so many things I think we could have invest in effectively, and there has been and will continue to be a revenue conversation in this state, but given the resources that we have, one of the most important things we can do to increase investment in behavioral health is to create a world where if you invest on the front end, if you invest in helping someone with their depression, and in so doing, you also help them better manage a chronic health condition like diabetes, and you generate savings from the physical health system, that you can recycle and reinvest that money into behavioral health. And the system we have today, with separate financing across behavioral health and physical health for the Medicaid population with significant behavioral health needs, that is not a system that facilitates that reinvestment. And instead, it's a system where year after year, and particularly in West Michigan, we have substantial financial challenges. And so that is why we are looking to change. Uh, there was a long conversation in Michigan around Section 298. Lots of important learning came from that conversation. It did not ultimately reach an agreement. And in our view, it, it was not actually the right solution. So we have proposed a different solution. Um, I'll do it super briefly, but the basic idea, this is not about the people all the way on the left, people with, with mild to moderate conditions. Uh, they will continue to be treated by Medicaid health plans. We have a status quo system where, as I said in the middle there, people are basically split in half. They have two different insurers, and because they have two different insurers, it makes it very difficult to reinvest, and it also reduces the level of frontline integration that is the ultimate integration that matters most. And so we want to move forward in a, in a world that reinvests in our safety net system, um, that integrates care to the maximum extent possible, and that uses a vehicle, we're calling them SIPs, some places call them SNPs, uh, specialty plans. These are used in several states, but they would be plans that combine the strengths and expertise of our frontline, strong, community-based behavioral health system with the administrative strengths and functions of an insurance plan. And we want to have several of those. We think that we can give families choices. We think that we can reduce the complexity at every level of the system. And most importantly, we think we can increase frontline integration and investment. So um, this is a subject that people in Michigan uh, we have been talking about this for a very long time. There's a tremendous amount of expertise to build on. 
We're doing community forums right now. I was in Detroit on Wednesday night. Our team was here in Grand Rapids last night. There is an enor enormous amount of, of expertise and passion that we are building on. And we think it's time to get something done. So we are excited to do that. We are eager for feedback. There's lots of learning we still have to do. Lord knows we don't have the answers, all the answers, but I think we are excited to advance this conversation in 2020. There's lots of other things I could talk about. I think the emphasis on, um, on how, do we, um, how do we provide the best possible quality for folks, the best possible outcomes, and make the best possible use of dollars is one that we are thinking about deeply in our Medicaid program. I think that the discussion of payment based on value is one that the department has been involved in and one where we see our thinking evolving and advancing in coming months. As I said at the beginning, the conversation about social determinants, we share the view that that is at the center of both improving outcomes and addressing disparities. And we'll have some new things to say about that in the new year. But um, I think I'll stop there. It's wonderful to be with you, uh, excited at the end of one year and excited for what, what we will be able to do in the years to come. Thanks a lot. Now we'll have a Q&A session for about 10 minutes, and then we will wrap up the program. Robert, I have a question for you. Do you see AmeriCorps as a cost-effective solution to increasing healthcare access, reducing health disparities, and building the service of healthcare workforce? I don't know if that question was, uh, was planted, because my first job, my real first job was on uh, getting the AmeriCorps legislation through Congress and then standing up the program. I, I'm embarrassed to say it's like 20, it's a really long time ago. But um, I'm a huge believer in AmeriCorps. I think it is a wonderful, people call it a Swiss Army knife because it has the capacity to get things done, as the slogan says, to, uh, to give young people skills and a path forward in college, and also this is just me, but, but to bring diverse people together in a way that builds community that Lord knows we need in this country today. So I think um, uh, I would, I've done some work with the AmeriCorps program. It used to be in MDHHS. It isn't anymore, but I would be delighted, more than delighted to have further conversations about what we can do to leverage AmeriCorps to get things done for health. Uh, another question, um, could you please identify, this is for anyone, one to two major forces shaping healthcare business landscape in West Michigan? What are the major forces shaping what we're going to do this year? Uh, certainly collaboration. Uh, all of us are working together uh, more than I've seen. I'm, I'm actually the senior, oh, I guess so, senior CEO of a hospital in this area. Hard to believe. <laughs> Um, Looking good, though, Ken. Thanks. <laughs> Actually, I'm the oldest, too. Anyway, uh, we are all working together. I was, uh, you know, to see uh, my three colleagues up here, and, uh, you know, I've, I've, we, in fact, uh, for the first time in 45 years, uh, we, as, uh, as um, uh, five CEOs, we've been together twice. And that was the first time that it had happened in 40 years. So I'd say collaboration is very important. Yeah. I'm going to keep moving in because we have so many questions. What initiatives are your hospitals implementing to change the culture of healthcare and wellness and diversity for not only patients but the whole organization? Maybe a couple of you could answer that one. Maybe I'll jump in real quick first. Uh, so I, I would separate that into two. From a culture of health and wellness, we've actually implemented what we call a lifestyle medicine program, which we're really starting to ramp up. Culinary medicine was just one example, but this is really focusing on stress reduction, on choosing the right behaviors, avoiding tobacco, alcohol, and actually having programming to help our employees and our communities do better with that. And from a diversity inclusion standpoint, we've hired our first chief diversity inclusion officer last year, Ovel Barbie, who's a wonderful man, who's really helping us look at our very large workforce and trying to really make sure that we have the right inclusion, uh, that we're focused on the right things, and that we match our communities that we serve. I think, uh, as Daryl said, we hired our first diversity, equity, inclusion uh, leader also, Dr. Ann Booker, who is from the community, 
been very helpful in explaining our uh, workforce in that uh, area. Also, trying to understand the safety and uh, quality issues and having a uh, zero harm mentality. Um, we need to make sure our uh, hospital acquired conditions are decreased and we provide the best care possible. And sometimes patients in the hospital, uh, things happen that we need to be better at. And it's having a lot of uh, mechanisms to prevent those uh, things from happening, make sure we uh, take care of patients best possible. Dr. Kim? Um, for us at Mercy Health, I'd say it's, it's not a change so much as taking it to the next level, you know, because as a newcomer, I, you know, even before I came in, I understood that um, Mercy Health had a reputation for people who genuinely are warm and caring putting our patients in one another first, and that's, that's definitely how it is. Um, and so we're just building on that to continue to serve and try to create a kind of healthcare system that fits more the kind of system we want for our loved ones too. I think one, uh, one thing that's not been said, but I, I know we're all working on this. We, uh, are, have, uh, we're really working on our board and our leadership so that we're looking at diverse issues uh, through the right lens. Uh, Dr. Gordon, uh, do you have any estimated time frame for the future system for behavioral health for Michigan? <laughs> we want to do it as, as quickly as we can do it well, and that means we'd like to get legislation done this year, and we think it's probably a couple years after that for implementation. Good. Um, this is intended for Kent. How are Michigan's new car insurance policy affecting health care rehab for patients? Mm -hmm. Um, it's disastrous for catastrophic patients. Uh, people will end up having to spend down beyond Medicaid and will uh, die as a result of it, frankly. Uh, we're working with state legislature right now in the governor's office to uh, work on some adjustments to the, to the uh, annual budgets to be able to take care of some of these patients. But it's really the catastrophic patients I, work, I worry about the most. Uh, this one was for Dr. Almucci. Um, please review the Spectrum Health Group prep virtual visits, you say 50% by what year? Ah, great. So uh, in terms of the virtual care we described, uh, we have a three-year time horizon, which we just started this year for our primary care visits uh, to be 50% of the eligible visits. So if someone actually has to touch you uh, to provide care, adjust an elbow, what have you, that would be in person. But for the virtual visits, 50% in three years. And then for specialty visits, we hope to have about 25% in three years. Perfect. Um, We've heard partnerships, personal population health coordination and quality, which are wonderful. Each of these require added documentation and reporting for those direct care teams. What ways do you see leveraging these partnerships to reduce outpatient primary care provider burden and promote stronger patient provider relationships as we see you in the room? Do you mind if I'm going to jump into that too? I'm sure everybody's going to have something to say. So, as a practicing physician, this means a lot to me. And for those of you that don't practice directly in healthcare, the burdens of documentation and electronic health records are immense. And you spend more of your time looking at a screen very often than looking at a patient. Uh, all of us, I'm sure, and actually the whole nation is trying to focus on this very specifically for us. And actually, we focus first in primary care, where the majority of our visits occurred. We have an initiative to try to reduce what's called the in-basket, which is the essentially the workload that comes at providers at all hours of the day that are electronic they have to manage by 70 percent. Uh, we've made about a 15 to 20 percent improvement, but we have an initiative in place that will use technology and partnering with vendors to actually reduce that further. And I would argue it's a combination of of all of us working together, the EHR vendors, and potentially regulators changing what we need. Uh, you're right, the documentation and regulations are becoming uh, onerous. And a study just came out recently that showed that for every one hour a physician spends with the patient, they spend two hours on their computer doing documentation. I mean, this is completely backwards. The tail's wagging the dog. We need to work on that. We're working with our electronic medical record to simplify uh, documentation and also how can we self populate a certain field so they don't have to do things two, three, four times. <laughs> I'll put it, a little there's no question it's the biggest dissatisfier yeah. among our clinicians. Yeah. I'll put a little plug in. We have the GBSU Scribe Academy. Any other comments? Uh, and actually it has increased significantly. A lot of students get the wonderful experience of scribing for physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs, and it really helps them in their programming. Which of these healthcare institutions are not for profit? My understanding is all of you are not for profit. Correct. Any aspects that are for profit they're wondering? 
Uh, I'll disclose for Spectrum Health, we have a separate subdivision called Ventures, uh, which is a division that's aimed at looking and investing in new technologies across the country. Uh, and that is a for-profit, very small, probably 1% or less of us arm. So what policies are you lobbying for? And will this help us reduce cost? I was going to say more money, but yeah. I think I won't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, more freedom for physicians to make the kind of choices that can reduce utilization. As I mentioned before, we think there's too much utilization uh, and uh, frankly, you know, getting away from a fee-for-service world is going to be, it's going to be um, rough and bumpy, uh, but we're also seeing self-serving influences in bundled and other models, payment models that um, are also not leading to long, good long-term uh, results. So. Uh, I think uh, more of a long-term view than a short-term view. Also better options for patients. If there's an institution that can get them better results, they should have the opportunity to go there and not be locked into uh, a specific uh, system. Um, for, you know, for us, our, uh, our team organizationally, we have a particular interest in serving those who are poor and vulnerable, and we just think um, there needs to be more that's done in terms of access and funding to allow for just more uh, leveling of healthcare options for everyone. And then I'll add one last comment there. Uh, we have a graph that our chief compliance officer shows us that has about 60 lines intersecting our health system, and I'm sure it's the same for all others, with regulations and rules. And many of those are very necessary and very good. But when you start looking at all the work that we all have to do to meet these, including the documentation demands, any simplification that occurs will make it easier for us to deliver care at a lower cost. And that's something we all likely strive to work for. And then would there ever be a plan or is there a plan to connect the IHRs for all the hospitals so that you can choose to go where you want, what provider and all that? Uh, in some ways, there are some of the providers, uh, if you have the same uh, electronic medical record, you can access other institutions from, from your own institution right now. But if they're in different uh, systems, it's much more problematic. But yeah, with that fact, said, we in all, a year we'll all be yeah. epic. Yeah. We'll so all, so yeah. once we're all on the same platform, which we will be, we can see each other's records very easily. Oh, right. It's actually a wonderful thing for the community. Great. And then just a couple of comments that people are making, so I'll just share the comments before we close. Um, hurry up with the smartphones. They want to do more on smartphones and their health. <laughs> and then one talked about women. There's not as many women CEOs and presidents and making sure we have the women's influence and voice, whether it's behavioral mm -hmm. health, health promotion, et cetera. I wish Tina was here instead yeah. of me. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So I want to thank each of you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for attending. You have a wonderful day, and our next uh, health forum is on the screen.